Good day, grade 12. Welcome to this next lesson in um, physical science. In this lesson, we're going to be looking at electrochemistry, very much like yesterday and the day before. Okay, and today's lesson, the first thing that we're going to be looking at is the standard hydrogen electrode. So what have we discussed so far? We've discussed the galvanic cell, we've discussed the electrolytic cell. Now we're going back to, remember I said to you that we're going to do things in bits, and now we're talking about the standard hydrogen electrode. Okay, so... It is the potential difference between or volts between two electrodes that cause electrons to flow from the anode to the cathode through the external circuit, circuit of a galvanic cell. Okay, so let me explain that to you in real words. Okay, if you have a galvanic cell, it's got two beakers. Okay, there is an electrode here, an electrode here, a salt bridge. <laughs> Sorry, I was just thinking it looks like a sad person. And then there is, and, and it's galvanic, so it has, that is not a battery at all. It is a light bulb. <laughs> okay, that's a light bulb. Okay, right. So that there is a galvanic cell. So what causes this electrons to flow is actually that there is a potential difference, a difference in the volts in these two electrodes, okay? So in order to measure the potential of a specific electrode and electrolyte, the standard reference electrode is used. Okay, so we've mentioned before that one of the we spoke about the rate of the rate of the electricity and everything else. And one of the things that we mentioned was that it depended on the type of um, electrode. So for example, zinc and copper, we knew that the way the electrons would flow. But what would happen if we put something else here? What happens if we, instead of zinc we had put, I don't know, lead, for example, or something else? So yes, okay, we could go around experimenting with everything. And luckily for us, there are some people that have already done a lot of the experiments or all the experiments at the moment that we need. Um, maybe I'm being narrow-minded. They've done most experiments. Okay, but what they did, which is very clever, is just as much as in your um, periodic table, everything is compared to carbon-12, okay? So even a mole is considered to be one twelfth of a carb of um, um, the number, okay, the mole, the amount of matter in a mole is the same as the amount of atoms there are in one twelfth of carbon-12, okay? Which happens to be the same as hydrogen. Um, so everything is compared to carbon, okay, on the like, on the on the periodic table. Similarly, yeah, what they did was they took a hydrogen electrode, which we're going to have a look at, and then they compared everything to the hydrogen electrode. They made hydrogen their standard. Okay, so this is the standard hydrogen electrode, and I'm going to click here and hopefully get through to the website. I have to say yes, and then we wait. There we go. Oh, God. Sorry. Let me go back to it. I think it's over here. There we go. Okay, so what we have is just a flash animation um, of basically the standard hydrogen electrode. So it says to compare the tendency of different metals to release electrons, a reference electrode is used, okay? So in other words, if we put zinc and copper in, we see that we're getting 1.1 volts out. Okay, awesome. But obviously, I don't want to go around and go, well, what would happen if I put lead or magnesium or calcium, or well, not calcium, um, or anything on this side? What would I get every time? Okay, it's crazy. So the better thing to do was to choose one thing, which they chose, and that was the standard hydrogen electrode. So it consists of hydrogen gas being bubbled into solution of hydrogen plus ions. So in this case, I've got hydrochloric acid, but it doesn't have to be hydrochloric acid. It could be sulfuric acid. It could be anything acidic, because what you really want is there to be a reaction from hydrogen. So hydrogen gas is bubbled through into this um, hydrochloric acid acid in this case or in a solution of water or like I said could be sulfuric acid any acid but note here and I will come back to these numbers you can see that the gas is at a pressure of 100 kilopascals that the temperature is 298 Kelvin and that the concentration of the solution is one mole per decimeter cubed and those are the standard conditions under which they were applied when they compared the standard hydrogen electrode to every other element out there Okay, so we know, think about this, okay, why is that important? Yesterday we spoke about reaction rates and chemical equilibrium, and we said that, 
It won't let me write on this wallet. No. Oh, hang on. Um, is this what is this? Is this edge or is the mozzarella? It's mozzarella. Damn it. Sorry. Okay. So, <laughs> so what you need to realize is that we spoke about pressure and temperature and concentration as being some of the things that affect your reaction rate and chemical equilibrium. So in order for us to always be able to compare like with like, we always need to do this test at 100 kilopascals, 298 Kelvin, and the concentration of one mole per decimeter cubed. Okay, so because hydrogen doesn't conduct, what they do is they actually um, put a metal piece of platinum electrode over it. Okay, so your platinum is basically gained, it says it's unreactive, but it basically allows for the reaction to occur. Okay, so it's just an electrode that allows the reaction to occur. Um, and your formula, or this, sorry, not the formula, the equation that you're going to get is 2H plus, plus two electrons is goes to H2 or depending on which way it's connected, H2 breaks up into two hydrogen plus ions plus two electrons. So either this reaction is going to be going this way, in which case it's going to take the hydrogen and it's going to bubble through and become this is going to become more acidic or the hydrogen ions in the solution are going to give off hydrogen gas. Okay. Finally, the hydrogen electrode potential is defined as zero. They just defined it as zero. So then what they did is when they connected another half cell to it, they can measure the voltage with respect to this hydrogen half cell. And that's considered to be the EMF or E theta. Now, I know that a lot of TT or teachers call this E zero, but it's actually E theta. That's a little theta sign there. And EMF is fine. It's just that, remember we spoke about EMF being the maximum voltage that it, a cell can supply, apply a circuit, okay, or battery can supply a circuit. This is it, okay, remember I told you that these are batteries. So the EMF that we're measuring here is this. So this, between, if we've got hydrogen half cell connected to a copper half cell, it can give you a maximum voltage of 0.3 volts. That's really what we're showing you here. Okay, so let's go back to the PowerPoint. Okay. So now let's talk about this again. So you'll see that the temperature is 25 degrees Celsius or 297 Kelvin. The hydrogen gas is at one atmosphere and the aqueous solution is at one mole per decimeter cubed. Okay, so first of all, the definition of the standard hydrogen electrode is a redox electrode which forms the basis of the scale of the oxidation reduction potentials. I have never seen them ask for the definition of the standard hydrogen electrode, never. But since it is in the curriculum, I've given it to you. You need to go and study the exam guidelines, the current exam guidelines, and check to see for yourself. I'm pretty sure it's not in the current exam guidelines. I think that this is one of the ones that skipped out. Okay, but what's important is it consists of platinum electrode in the solution containing hydrogen plus ions. And this platinum electrode works again like a catalyst in the sense that it doesn't participate in the reaction, just rouse a surface over which the hydrogen gas can dissolve into the aqueous solution or vice versa, which means that after a hundred years of using this maybe not 100, but yes, if you, 100 years of using the standard hydrogen electrode, the specific one, um, continuously, I could take that piece of platinum out, I could clean it, and then I could use it for something else because it, nothing's happened to it. It hasn't participated in the reaction whatsoever, okay? So as the hydrogen gas bubbles over the platinum electrode, the following reaction occurs. So the hydrogen gas breaks up two hydrogen plus and two electrons are given off and they go up through the wire. But that's if it's connected one way. The other way that could have happened is that the electrons could come down here and it could cause the hydrogen to be attracted to the piece of metal, form hydrogen, and then the hydrogen would bubble up through there. So it totally depends on whether this reaction is going forward or backwards, and that depends on what it's connected with, okay? So if we use a standard hydrogen cell with zinc, okay? So if we look at this, this is just a small diagram, a short diagram to explain to you, okay? So this is a hydrogen electrode, okay? So just let me go back for a second. It looks like this, right? And you know what the zinc electrode is supposed to look like. This is just a very basic 
um, imagery for you guys to understand what's going on, okay? Zinc has a greater tendency than hydrogen to be oxidized, okay? Remember, we've got oil rig. And remember that oxidation is loss of electrons. So zinc, the metal, has got a greater tendency than hydrogen to lose its electrons, right? So zinc will therefore be relatively more negative. So then what happens is the electrons are released when zinc is oxidized and will accumulate on the metal, okay? So what's gonna happen is you're gonna have zinc goes to zinc, two plus, plus two electrons, okay? The voltmeter measures the potential difference of negative 0.76. So what is going to happen is, and, you'll, and I'll talk to you about why it's negative 0.76. So what's going to happen is these electrons are going to flow up along here, okay? And they're going to go, if you want to think of it this way, from a high concentration to a low concentration. So what's happening then is these electrons are metal. Remember I spoke to you about, let me just go back up again. Yeah, remember I said to you that sometimes the metal gains electrons, okay, so if we go back down, okay, yeah, the electrons are coming down, okay, and they make this metal, elect the electron, this metal be more negative, okay, by doing that, what we end up with is that the hydrogen plus ions in the solution are attracted to the electrons in the in the on the white on the piece of metal on the platinum and they end up forming hydrogen gas and the hydrogen gas then forms okay so that is the reaction that is happening with zinc okay if we have what's going on there? if we have copper it works the other way around in this case copper has a lower tendency to than hydrogen to be oxide oxidized so copper is relatively ne less negative okay so in this case what's happening is that the hydrogen gas is being bubbled over it forms hydrogen plus ions plus two electrons and these electrons travel up the wire from an area of high concentration down to an area of low concentration so this becomes more negative if that happens copper two plus ions in the solution around it are going to gain the two electrons from the electrode to form copper. So do you see that this is doing an opposite thing? In the previous example, the hydrogen, the hydrogen plus ions are gaining two electrons to form hydrogen gas. So yeah, it's giving off hydrogen gas. Whereas yeah, we can see that the hydrogen gas is forming hydrogen ions plus the two electrons. Okay, so that means the copper is more likely to form solid copper than the hydrogen ions are to form hydrogen gas. And the voltmeter reading is going to be 0.34. So do you see, don't worry about the number, do you see that this is plus 0.34, whereas the other one was minus 0.76, I think it was, let me just check, yeah, 76. Don't worry about the quantity, but notice the minus and plus. And what does that mean? The minus and plus is just giving us direction. It's giving us direction of the electrons. So on that note, <laughs> just to get onto my little platform for a second. At school, when you're at school and you're doing electric circuits and they ask you to connect a voltmeter and then the teacher goes, no, you connected the voltmeter in the wrong way. Officially, actually, there is no way to connect the voltmeter in the wrong way. Admittedly, at school, you've got the cheaper version, usually. You've got the cheaper versions of the voltmeters, which start with a zero on this side. So if you connect them, the inverted commas, wrong way, then what's going to happen is your little lever or your marker is going to go that way. Okay, and that's why the teacher is saying it's the wrong way because you in fact can't read it. Okay, and then you have to change your wires around. Okay, okay, and then what's more, they tend to say to you, well, the red has to go to the red wire and the black has to go to the black wire. Okay, that's wonderful. Except that the red and black have absolutely nothing to do with the transfer of electricity and electrons. The red and the black are basically the color of the plastic around the metal. And the electrons that are traveling in the red and the black wires don't actually know the color of the, of the plastic around them. So you can make these wires be pink, purple, 
I don't know, spotted with orange dots and flowers, it wouldn't make a difference which way the electrons flow. In real life, if we're talking analog voltmeters, not these nice, beautiful digital voltmeters, your voltmeter starts at zero in the middle, okay? And then there's no way for you to be able to connect it incorrectly because if it goes, if the, if the, the indicator goes this way, it just means the electrons are flowing one way, and if the indicator goes that way, it means the electrons are flowing in the opposite direction. Okay, so do you understand that it really doesn't matter? And if you guys have ever worked with circuit boards, you guys know this. If you've worked with circuit boards, very basic circuit boards, it actually doesn't matter whether you connect your batteries like that, or you connect your batteries with the pointy ends, the positive ends this way, as long as they're both in the same direction. Okay, so in other words, positive, negative, positive, negative, versus positive, negative, positive, negative. It really doesn't matter when you're drawing a, doing a circuit board, okay? Um, because then you have draw, you're actually building the circuit up yourself so you can decide which way it goes. It obviously makes a difference if one of them is going from positive to negative and the other one's going from negative to positive because then your current's not going to flow anyway. Okay, so that's me on my little... Um, I just get very frustrated when I have students that get to university and they still don't realize that the color of the wire actually makes no difference to which way the electrons flow. Okay, so... There we go. So now we know what happens when we connect different cells to the hydrogen half cell. So what does that mean? That means we now can get this table. And guys, there are two tables. There's one table called 4A and another table called 4B. Now, I don't mind which table you guys learn to use, but I'm going to be working from table 4B, okay, table 4B, which has got lithium at the top, okay. Most of the textbooks work from table 4B. Some of the older textbooks work with table 4A. And there's not much difference, they've just flipped, okay. Table 4A has got fluorine at the top and table 4B has got lithium at the top. The only thing is that the way you use them and the tricks that you use with them are different. So if you insist on using table 4A, then you got to kind of ignore my tricks. You can listen to all the other stuff, but you have to ignore the tricks, okay? So let's go through it. The standard electrode potentials. So the voltage is recorded when the zinc and copper connected with the two standard, or for these, are the standard electrode potentials for these two metals, okay? So they're all relative to hydrogen. So what happens is if you look carefully here, and again, like I've said before, guys, you guys should have your formula sheets and your redox table, this table, the standard electrode potential table out while we are studying science so that if you can't see it on this page then at least you could be looking at it on your page okay so the values are all relative to hydrogen and you can see that all these are minus and all these are plus and all that is telling us is which way the electrons are flowing that's all it is okay not really too worried about that, but I'm just saying. So now we can see that these are minuses, these are pluses, okay? So a large positive value means that the compound gains electrons easily, okay? So a large positive means that the compound gains electrons because it means it attracts electrons. So it just means it is easily reduced. So therefore, these are going to be more easily reduced, okay? These over here, they are more easily reduced. But if they're more easily reduced, what are they? They're obviously stronger, stronger oxidizing agents, oxa stronger oxidizing agents. Okay. And on similarly, yeah, these are going to be more easily oxidized, which means they are going to be stronger reducing agents, okay, agents, agents. Okay, so another thing you need to realize is that everything on this periodic table, I mean this redox table can react with everything else, okay? So that was if I put calcium and sodium in a reaction together, they will react. 
possibly. Okay, it depends on what, what it is, and I'll explain to you how to work it out in a minute. But everything, the only thing that can't go both ways is obviously your lithium and your fluorine. With respect to everything else on this table, obviously there are a whole bunch of half reactions that are not included on this table, okay? This is just the basic redox reactions that this, the curriculum wants you to understand and know about. So, like I said, if they're easily reduced, then they are a stronger oxidizing agent, which means they're causing oxidizing to happen to the other thing, okay? So, the reducing ability obviously then decreases down the table, okay? Strong reducing, strong reducing, okay, not so much at the bottom. Strong reducing, strong oxidizing. And like I said to you, this is with respect to table 4B. If you're looking at table 4A, it's going to be the other way around, okay? And the nice thing for you guys is that actually on the formula sheet, your redox table actually does have arrows. It actually says on table 4B, it actually says, it goes with this and it goes increasing oxidizing ability. And then it's got an arrow that goes up like this and it goes increasing reducing ability. How nice is that of them? They didn't have to do that. Okay, so now oxidizing ability of the compounds increases as you move down the table. Okay, right, happy. So now we're going to look at the use of standard electrode potentials. And this is very important. I don't know if you remember, but at the beginning of the section, I said to you guys that with redox, a couple of things that you really need to know to be able to do fairly well in the section. I mean, I'm not talking about brilliantly, just as in fairly well. All you need to know is anox, red cat, oil rig, and how to use this table. Okay. To, if you get that, you that's about 70 to 80% of the content for the section, okay? So the rest is, and obviously the difference between the galvanic and electrolytic cells, okay, obviously. Okay, but, <laughs> but if you get that, that's 70 to 80% of the section. So I'm really going to be stressing this, okay, and making sure you know how to use this, okay? So let's go through it nice and slowly. So it says, the question is, is magnesium able to displace silver from a solution of silver nitrate? So when you read this question, you need to realize that we're being given magnesium. We're actually given magnesium in the solid form, okay? Not magnesium, I'm just magnesium. And it's, is it says, is it able to displace silver from a solution of silver nitrate? Yeah, we're talking about Ag plus ions. Going to Ag, we are forming silver, from silver plus ions. And that's important because that tells us which way we're going, okay? So the first thing, step one, we're gonna find appropriate reactions on the standard electrode potentials, okay? So this might take a little bit of time. And admittedly, it might be the wrong way around on this table, as in Mg might be on the right-hand side and Ag might be on the left-hand side or the right-hand side. Doesn't matter, we're just gonna identify them. So if you look carefully, you can see here is Mg2 plus, plus two electrons, goes to Mg and it's both ways, okay? That arrow shows it goes both ways. And if we go down to over, where is silver? There it is. If you go down to over here, we've got Ag plus plus an electron goes to silver. Okay, so we found the appropriate reactions in the table of standard electrode potential. Step two, it says determine the electrode potential of each metal. So if we look at this, magnesium is sitting at minus 237, minus 2.37, and Ag, the silver half reaction, is 0.80 volts. Okay, but what did we say? Remember we said that which metal is more likely to be reduced well, Ag has a positive electrode potential, so we know therefore that it is more likely to be reduced, okay? So this is going to be the reduction, reduction half reaction, and this is going to be the oxidation half reaction, okay? Reduction half reaction, oxidation. If we just go up for a second, do you remember I said to you that this is increasing oxidizing ability and that's increasing reducing ability, 
ability. If you've got a strong reducing ability, you're being oxidized. If you've got a strong oxidizing ability, you're being reduced. So therefore, the bottom one should be the reduction half reaction, and the top one should be the um, oxidation half reaction. So now we can write the half reactions. Okay, now here's the trick I was telling you about that you can use to check if this is going to happen. If you can draw this as a C, if you can go, okay, I'm starting at magnesium. I'm starting at magnesium. Okay, I could go to magnesium 2 plus, we don't really care. But then I'm going to silver plus. Yes, I'm moving from the silver plus to the silver the silver. Can I draw a C? If I can draw a C, then this reaction is going to work. Okay. If I can't draw a C, then this reaction is not going to work. So if I, for example, had started with magnesium ions, then I would have started with, I would have drawn it like this. I would have started over here and gone to magnesium and then drawn there and gone to silver plus ions going to silver. So do you agree that would have been wrong? That would have been totally wrong because I don't have magnesium. That doesn't form a C, okay? So now let's just clear this. Clear. I wonder if I can get rid of all the green without messing up the rest of my stuff. Let's see. Ah, lost the blue. Okay, never mind. Okay, so let me draw it in again. Okay, so it goes that way. Okay, so what, and the, it's this, this reaction, right? Okay, so what would the reaction be? It would be magnesium goes to, and now listen, grade 12s. As soon as you start writing them as half reactions, you don't do a double arrow anymore. Because now we're saying, we're starting with magnesium, and we're going to magnesium 2 plus, plus 2 electrons. Okay, then we're starting with, Ag plus plus an electron is going to Ag. Okay, so that that's our two half reactions. Okay, so do you see that? Yes, we are going to get silver out because we're going from Ag plus to Ag, so we are actually going to get silver out. So we didn't actually even need to write down the two half reactions because it's obvious from here that ox that silver is more easily reduced, so we're going to get it out. But if we wanted to, we could write this as a full balanced reaction. But in order to do that, we need to balance the electrons. Do you see that here magnesium is giving off two electrons? This reaction is only using up one electron. So in order for the electron numbers to be equal, in order for to balance this equation, we have to make these electrons be equal. So I'm going to multiply this by two. Okay, so what do we end up with then? We end up with Mg plus two Ad pluses. This cancels with that. Goes to Mg two plus plus two Ag. Okay. And then if you really want to, we can actually fill in the spectator ion. Now, originally we had silver nitrate, so it's AgNO3, right? That breaks up into Ag plus and NO3 minus, okay? So now we need to add this into spectator ions. Now, just for the record, the curriculum doesn't require, the CAPS curriculum does not require you to put the spectator ions in. It's not a requirement. So... As far as I understand, no exam should ask you to write in or fill in the spectator ions. I'm still going to show you in this example how to do it, just in case. Never know, okay? Or if your teacher decides to give you a bit of an extension question in the prelims, which they're quite welcome to do, um, they can actually do that. And that means that we are going to do that now. So wherever you're seeing an ion, an ion, yeah, we've got to join it up with the nitrate, the spectator ion. So it's going to be Mg plus 2. This is just a plus, so it's going to go back to the nitrate. So it's 2 AgNO3 goes to, but do you see this is Mg2 plus, and this is nitrate, so it's NO3 minus. So we need two of these to join up to the magnesium for that to balance. So it's going to be Mg bracket NO3 2. Okay, let me explain again. Nitrate is NO3 minus. Magnesium is 2 plus. So to balance, we need two nitrate ions. So therefore, we've got MgNO3 2 
plus two silvers. So yes, we get silver out. Yay! Okay, now, let's do another one. It says for a zinc and gold three oxide silver solution with potassium hydroxide, we need to determine the following. One, the oxidation reduction half reactions. Two, the overall balanced chemical equation. And three, the standard cell notation of the cell. Okay, so we're now going to do this step by step, okay? So we're going to start off again and we're doing exactly the same as what we did before. Exactly the same, okay? So first of all, we're going to find the oxidation and reduction half reaction. So it says we are given zinc, we're given zinc, and we're given gold three. It says Au3 oxide. Let me just check something. Yes. So it's Au3 plus oxide, okay? Don't worry about the solution of potassium hydroxide. Okay, so we need to find those two half cells, okay? So we need zinc and we need Au3 plus. So we need to go through it. We need to find zinc. Zinc, zinc, zinc. There is zinc. Okay, zinc plus zinc 2 plus gives you zinc. And now we need Au3 plus. Au, gold is Au, that's Ag. There you go, there's Au3 plus plus 3 electrons, gives you Au. Okay, so again, I can immediately do my C. I will do it. Here we go. Okay, I'm going from zinc to zinc 2 plus, then it would go down. And I'd get Au3 plus and I'd end up with gold. And what was the question? Um, it said find the two half cells. So do you agree it was definitely going to work because I've added my zinc to my Au3 plus. Okay, so it works. We actually, uh, it forms a beautiful C. So this is a spontaneous reaction. Now it says we're going to find the appropriate reactions on the table, which we've done. Okay. Step two, we're going to determine the electric potential for each of the metals. So do you see that zinc is minus 0.76 and gold half cell is 1.50 okay so sorry so since that is the case do you agree that this guy is going to be remember that this dude here 1.5 is going to be the increasing oxidizing ability so he's going to be more easily reduced because he's more positive he's going to attract the electrons more strongly, so it's going to be more easily reduced, more easily reduced, okay? So therefore, this is the reduction half reaction, and this is the oxidation half reaction. Okay, so now we've said that. <laughs> so zinc is more negative, therefore gold is more easily reduced, okay? So now I need to find them again because this is a new slide and unfortunately I forgot to bring the red through. So we've got zinc is over here. Whee! Okay, and gold is over here. Whee! Okay, so if we do it, do you agree that we've got zinc? Single arrow, please note, is going to zinc 2 plus plus 2 electrons. The oxidation, because zinc oxidation is lost, remember oxidation is lost. Oh, that's reduction half reaction. Try again. Reduction half. Okay, no, let's do oxidation. Zinc is going to zinc 2 plus plus 2 electrons. Oxidation is lost. Reduction is in the direction it's given. Au 3 plus plus 3 electrons goes to Au. Okay. Now we're going to compare the electrons in each electro in each equation and then we're going to balance it. Okay, so let's do that. So I'm going to change color. There are three electrons here and two electrons here. So do you agree the easiest way to do this is multiply this by two and that by three? So if I do that, this is two, this becomes six and this becomes two. This becomes three, this becomes three and that becomes six. So my overall reaction is going to be two Au3 plus plus three Zn goes to 2Au plus 3Zn2 plus. Okay, because these cancel. So that's my overall reaction. Happy with that. Okay, now it says combine into one equation. Okay, so we've done that. That's nice and easy. Okay, everybody happy with that. So that's basically what has happened. If I now wanted to write that in the cell notation, 
Do you remember that it was anode? Then the, what I call the anode juice, it's the electrolyte, the anode's electrolyte. Then there's a salt bridge, then there's a cathode's electrolyte, and then there's the cathode, okay? Now remember that what happens at the anode is oxidation. How do we know that? Because we know anox. Oxidation occurs at the anode and we know red cat. Reduction occurs at the cathode. Reduction occurs at the cathode. So we could write this out, okay, as, oh dear, 